As the world seems to be facing an increasingly bumpy recovery amid the new geopolitical uncertainties, China and South Korea have been respectively working hard on the issue of climate change. Both countries have ambitious carbon emission goals in the near future, accelerating the shift away from their previously coal-reliant economies. Earlier, I sat down with former South Korean Prime Minister Han Jun Su to see how the two countries expand cooperation on climate change, pandemic control and prevention, and multilateralism. In addition to serving as South Korean Prime Minister from 2008 to 2009, he was also the President of UN General Assembly from 2001 to 2002. Meanwhile, he served as the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change. Let's listen in. Mr. Prime Minister, what a pleasure to see you on CGTN. Well, I'm also pleased to be invited for the interview. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. Let me start by asking about the carbon issue. China has pledged a 2030-2060 carbon peak, carbon neutrality. I understand where you are. South Korea has also been making commitment in that regard. Tell me how the two countries are likely to be encouraging for one another in that area. Well, um, President Xi Jinping announced last September that China will aim to peak emission before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. This is a very bold and ambitious target for China. Uh, everybody in the world is affected, will be affected by it. In order to achieve 1.5 Celsius, degree Celsius of the Paris Climate Agreement, we need the world needs China's close cooperation. As you may know, as of 2018, China accounted for 27.3% of the global carbon emission, while U.S. for 14.9%. Together, United States and China together accounted for about 41% of the global carbon emission. Therefore, China's role in uh, the uh, achievement of the Paris the climate agreement is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Now I hear that China is going to introduce carbon market. Yes. And I'm sure that carbon market will expand the role of supply and demand for carbon in the market and will play a very important role in reducing carbon emissions. Korea, of course, has been going through this process and we have also announced um, carbon neutrality by 2050. And we are very happy that uh, my government is supporting uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Mm. Mr. Prime Minister, you are, you have been with tremendous efforts working on the climate change issue, starting from earlier in the, with the United Nations. Now tell me, how do you, as a veteran of the issue, see the ups and downs of the issue over the years due to geopolitics and politics? Well, as you may know, I also appointed the special envoy of the UN Secretary General for yes. Climate Change in 2007 before I entered, rejoined the government as a prime minister. At the time, I was appointed together with Gro Harlem Brundtland, former prime minister of Norway, and also Ricardo Lagos, uh, former president of Chile. And three of us worked together. And uh, that was the year, 2007 was a very important year in the history of climate change because we had the COP13, Conference of Party 13 in Bali, Indonesia. Mm. And um, we had to encourage the global leaders to uh, attend the uh, COP13. Therefore, Guru Harlem, Brundtland was allocated to Europe and Africa and Lagos to Americas. And I was allocated to Asia and the Pacific to go around to meet the leaders, to invite them to attend the COP13. Uh, and as you may know, COP13 was a great success because um, at the time, Kevin Rudd, then uh, Australian Prime Minister, just elected, right. came to attend the meeting, said that uh, he, Australia, will uh, um, uh, agree to join the um, Kyoto Protocol, mm -hmm. which was a fantastic news at the time. But at the same time, we also invited by the U.S. Uh, Congress to testify in front of them. So three of us went to the U.S. Congress and uh, testified before the members of the House of Representatives. 
what, I, what we found was that there was a clear divide between the party lines, Republicans against and Democrats for the climate change. So um, it was a very interesting experience. Now, Mr. Prime Minister, we could say we are at a better time right now, but the national politics and election cycle is never far away from us. So as a veteran, once again, how do you see the realities today? How do we make sure this momentum will continue and will not be disrupted as we have witnessed over the past 10 years or so and beyond? Well, you know, climate change is um, um, external economy of uh, global scale. Everybody has to be there unless uh, then it cannot be, uh, it cannot be solved. So whether it's a big country or small country, everybody has to be. Fortunately, as of today, I think there's no one country in the world which is against the achievement of the Paris Climate Agreement. But the implementing this, um, uh, this uh, agreement in yeah. the next 30 years is another question because we have never done it before and we have to do it learning by doing yes. and um, and also we have broken so many promises in the past for example uh, UNFCC 1992 and um, Kyoto Protocol 1997 and also uh, the Durban agreement there were major agreement at the time but no country have uh, really achieved uh, carried out that agreement to the to the to the end and so we are now here although uh, everybody is agreed to have uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 we have to wait and see what will happen mr prime minister i understand you are working on the issue of water a lot these days as we know <clears throat> The overall environmental issue is a huge topic and in which there are various categories of issues and water certainly is one of those most crucial uh, because it means geopolitics, it means peace and war, it means access to real uh, basic human rights in a way. Uh, so how do you see, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, countries and governments are facing up to the issue of water. What are the complexities you would uh, illustrate for us now? As you may know, the climate change is um, exposed to the humanity through water. Yes. When temperature goes up, sea level water gets warmer and you create more uh, steams that creates um, uh, typhoons or hurricanes or cyclones or whatnot. And also when it's too hot, then you have a lot of um, uh, area where it is arid. So water is very essential uh, sort of in dealing with the climate change issues. But apart from that, water disaster itself is also very important. Every year, billions of people are affected by the water disasters. And with the, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic now, we are having two difficult problems altogether. That is that when you have a water disasters, typhoons, people tend to cluster in the school or in public area to uh, shelter from the water and flood. But in the case of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, people should not cluster. So people mm -hmm. has to not get together. So when you have a water disaster during the COVID-19 pandemic, you have this problem, paradoxical problem of trying to deal with this problem. Co-occurrence of disasters are very, very difficult. So uh, we in the water community is very much worried about this situation. Mr. Prime Minister, people are talking about the issue of a pandemic. And we all know that's the priority we really need to deal with together with other global issues. But there is a lack of cooperative spirit in terms of uh, uh, how we can cooperate right now. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you are a seasoned politician. You're also a veteran of globalization. How do you see the current situation? Do we need statesmen, stateswomen? Do we need leadership? Do we need the grassroots up? efforts. What do we need now 
so that we can come out of this deadlock, as we all know. And having served my government at time of very close global cooperation, I am a little bit dismayed to see the current state of affairs. Uh, but we have to come back to the basics, ideals of the United Nations. There are a lot of areas where all the nations of the world can work together, like climate change, for example, water disaster. These are the issue, not uh, uh, affecting just one country, but we are all affected by it. So we have to choose the area of mutual concern and mutual uh, commonality, and then try to work, work, work together. So mm -hmm. in that respect, I think the role of climate change is really very important. Also, water and disaster is also very important. Right. But Mr. Prime Minister, you know, everything could be politicized or geopoliticized. We see that with the pandemic about the virus origin, about the vaccines, about the distribution, about who use what. Uh, all of these are politicized. But in fact, it is a pandemic issue. It's a global health issue. So how much confidence do we have, Mr. Prime Minister? I have to invite for your intelligence here, you know, about that we are not going to politicize or further politicize the, the climate change issue, the water issue, the carbon issue, Mr. Prime Minister? Well, I think uh, it's unfortunate that uh, COVID-19 pandemic is becoming a political issue. But in actual fact, uh, in order to, to deal with the COVID-19, we are happy to see that the vaccines are now uh, invented and many people are now being subject to vaccination. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that many countries are now giving vaccine doses to their people. But unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, country, developed, developing countries where they, are not, uh, they do not have uh, vaccine doses as much as they wanted. In a sense, we have, just as 20 years ago, we had a digital divide. We are now having COVID-19 divide, mm -hmm. divide between developed and developing countries. Therefore, I think uh, rich countries should not hold their vaccine doses, but try to uh, give uh, to the developing countries so that uh, all the nations of the world, people of the world, nations of the world can benefit from it. If we don't do that, if we have uh, one area, poor area of the world, not, con not uh, vaccinated, then that will be a center of the future pandemic. So we are all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. I hope many would understand that, that very basic fact, Mr. Prime Minister. But on the other hand, I also want to ask you, because uh, there is the issue of leadership. We have been hearing from many others about, you know, when are we going to see the real statesman? At a time of global crisis, at a time of uh, uh, global issues, that is urgently needed. Mr. Prime Minister, you served in various uh, administrations, you also served in the United Nations. You see the ups and downs of politics, national and international. How do you see that? Well, I think um, in some area, leadership is there. In some area, leadership is not there. Fortunately, in the area of uh, mutual concern, like water and um, COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, I think global leadership is there. Only problem is how to coordinate their leadership on mm. these particular issues. So um, we really have to choose the area where leaders can cooperate together intensively. And then uh, from there, we can expand the area of leadership to other more contentious area, eventually mm -hmm. trying to solve the problems more sort of amicably and peacefully. This is the time when the international mechanism have been weakened. But at the same time, one could also argue the system needs to be upgraded and updated. That includes the United Nations, that includes WHO, that includes WTO, and the name goes on. Uh, but, you know, to what extent it's about reform? To what extent it's about uh, that all needs to understand the importance and significance of these global platforms? that are existing today, Mr. Prime Minister? Well, there are many international non-governmental organizations like, for example, Club de Madrid, which is the uh, meeting of the former head of state and government, yes. has a very interesting sort of uh, forum to encourage global leaders to get together to deal with the problems of the present uh, concern. Mm. So. Um, 
I am actually a little bit uh, optimistic about this. Pe government leaders in some countries are not, may not be, but I think on the whole, there is a genuine need of the leaders and as well as former leaders to work together to create a better future for our gener next generation. Mr. Prime Minister, you belong to the generation that experienced the very climax of the Cold War. How do you see the qualities of leadership at a time of such dramatic change as we are witnessing today? As I said, we have to go back to the basics. And at the time of, for example, international global financial crisis of 2008 and 9, right. all the world is gathered together to create G20. And that has worked very well. Now, uh, in time of a crisis like this, I think the global leaders has to meet together to discuss the issue of uh, glo global concern. Fortunately, um, a few weeks ago, we had G7 meeting in Cornwall in the United Kingdom. And at the time, it was uh, not online, but offline meeting. I think even G20, for example, should get together uh, face, face to face and try to deal with the problems. When you meet the people, the situation becomes a little bit easier mm -hmm. and uh, you can really talk to each other more frankly than by giving or sending um, uh, messages so on papers or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate that we are going through a very difficult time of COVID-19, but as soon as this situation eases, I hope that global leaders will get together. At the United Nations headquarters, for example, it will be a good place uh, in September. Usually the General Assembly has a meeting then. Mm. So all the leaders should get together and try to talk to each other and um, face to face and try to discuss the problem, their concern, as well as global concern, so that they can leave some legacy, good mm. legacy to the future generation. Mr. Prime Minister, what a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. All the best wishes.